In this week's episode of Studio Inter, we'll be analysing Sassuolo and Liverpool defeats. A full post-mortem, we'll be talking about the lack of goal scorers, if Lautaro Martinez should be sold, Scamacca, Raspadori and Fratesi, if they are the answer. We'll be previewing the game against Genoa, this week Moji, Moratti and Frog, and much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter, on Inter.com. Benvenuti, bentornati to another edition of Studio Inter. I'm your host, Nima Tavallo Iruzzeri, wishing you welcome to a show where we don't have a special guest today because we want to focus entirely on this little crisis. Or not so little, but it is a crisis at Inter after a dreadful month of February with three defeats and one draw. Um, and But before we get to all of that, let me begin by introducing my panelists, starting with the SempreInter.com preview writer who is known as is the artist known as Mr. Positivity, but I think this episode he might be the artist formerly known as Mr. Positivity, Mr. <laughs> Mohamed Nasa. <laughs> How are you doing, Mo? Yeah. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm hurting, man. But uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see how we can turn the ship around. Mm. And he said ship and not the stuff that comes that, that rhymes with ship that is crap. <laughs> um <laughs> but also I meant that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Ram, we're joined by a good friend of ours um, uh, who who writes the weekly uh, What We Learned From Inter This Week um, uh, column, which is also a talking point um, in, our, in today's episode. Uh, we'll, I'll get more to that uh, when we get to the actual stuff, but welcome, Mr. Jake Smalley. Good evening. Um, I don't know why. I can already sense that Mo's a lot more positive than me, which I'm actually quite happy about because I'm hoping uh, <laughs> you can help me out a bit. I'm, I'm absolutely, I feel like I've aged about 15 years in February. You know, we, we talk about the start of February and how positive um, it, things were after Christmas and you look at the way they are now. And it's Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get to it then, because I think it's quite obvious to say that the Inter's annual winter depression was postponed to February this year, because the results speak for themselves. Dominated the derby for 75 minutes, lost it due to individual errors and inability to score goals and to make your domination, uh, make those chances pay and to convert your domination into scoring, scoring chances. Same thing against Liverpool. Played Liverpool toe to toe, head to head but can't score to save their lives. And Liverpool are too good. And when you miss chances against teams of that quality, you you they will score and you lose. Um, Napoli, same thing there. Lucky to be in the game after the first 45 minutes, after what was up until then the worst 45 minutes under Simone Inzaghi, but came back in the second half, a little bit lucky to get the equaliser, um, controlled the game and, uh, and, and got a draw there. And then the, the Sassuolo game, where it was by far the worst game for 90 minutes under Simone Inzaghi. I think that was the new bottom bottom of the level, bottom of the barrel that we've hit under Inzaghi. And I mean, let, let, we're going to discuss everything, because um, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's not just one thing that is the reason why uh, things have gone the way they have or, or did go against Sassuolo. Let's start with... Um, Let's start with uh, the, 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 this, this goal scoring, the, the fact that Inter need 25 chances to score two goals. This is something that we've seen throughout this season. I don't particularly like when people say that this is a phase. It's not a phase. This is, Inter has struggled with this throughout this season. They've created lots of chances, but they miss a lot of chances. The difference with the beginning of the season was that then the team was in form and other players were in form and stepped up and made up for it. Now, now that the team is a little bit out of form or is out of form, you don't have that. And so when you when you still have that original problem, it gets worsened. Let's start there before we go to the to the rest. I mean, I, I, where where do we go with this, Mo? I mean, this is getting ridiculous, and and it's going to hurt, it's hurting Inter, and and it could even end up costing them the scudetto. What do you think? Well, let, let me first uh, earn my uh, earn my keep as uh, Mr. Positivity and, and just <laughs> frame this by saying, you know, if there is a week to royally, you know, stuff it, this was the week. You know, we just see, we just seen that Napoli uh, have drawn against Cagliari. 
uh, Milan uh, drew against Salernitana, Juve drew against Torino. It's Atalanta it's, lost it's, against Fiorentina. Atalanta lost against Fiorentina. So Atalanta lost at home against Fiorentina, of course. Yes. So if there is one week to 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 you know to stuff it, this this was the week. So you know, in terms of the bigger picture of the Scudetto race, it doesn't change much. We still have that one game in hand that should put us ahead. So we didn't. We've only lost one point to uh, both Napoli and and, and Milan. Uh, while still maintaining our, our 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 lead over them, mathematically or otherwise, should we of course beat uh, Bologna for, with our for our game in hand? So that's one thing. What I'd like to also say is that in all the games that we've spoken on about, I don't think. I mean, I haven't done I haven't done a deep dive into the creation of chances, but I would imagine the XG. On the Lautaro and the Sanchez chances yesterday would have been like just I don't know what what XG is like a one XG or a ten XG whatever it is on the chance but it's almost certainly a, a, a proven goal goal scoring opportunity so well and the Zeko header as well so th- there were chances uh, the, and the Zeko almost happened as well so there's at least four chances that were created that you know I think. Under normal circumstances, even with the wastefulness of our strikers, they they should have scored those, scored at least two of those. So I think the the fact that they haven't been scoring goals now, recently, is just an added layer of of mental pressure on these strikers. And you could see that in their body language yesterday. Everyone was so frustrated and 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 really, um, you know, wound up and and. You know, uh, I, I don't think they were in the right mental space, and this is this is partially on the players, and it's also partially on Inzaghi. He's supposed to be able to manage these players, particularly his you know mal uh, misfiring uh, component of uh, the misfiring component of his squad, his attack, and be able to put them in the right state of mind. So, what you know, long story short, you're right. You're right in that uh, the crisis is not something new. They have been. They have been, you know, wasteful from the very beginning of the season. But I also don't believe that we're creating any less chances. And this is what I haven't done a deep dive in. I mean, maybe somebody out there can, can, you know, fact check me or something. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel to me in any of the games, whether it's the Liverpool game or the Napoli game or the or the um, or the derby or even yesterday's shit show uh, of a match. I I don't feel that in any of the matches. Uh, we have been less able to create the chances. It's just the strikers have become even more wasteful than they have been earlier. And this is probably owing to, like you said, a multitude of factors, whether it's fatigue from the ridiculous schedule that they've had from the beginning of the season, um, frust- like a downward spiral of frustration at the lack of scoring opportunities. And so both the strikers and Inzaghi need to you know, come up with an answer, whether it's you know, bringing in someone else to score, like you said, whether it's a Perisic, whether it's Gosens when he comes, when he's finally fully fit, whether it's involving Dumfries even more, whether it's you know getting getting some some scoring opportunities from outside the box, asking Hakan to shoot more, I don't know, but what's for sure is that until we break the scoring duck, a major component from from the outside looking in of why we continue to miss these chances and continue to miss the chance, chances in an accelerated rate. To me, is a psychological pressure of not being able to score. So some something has to give before they start scoring again, uh, and before this gets resolved. But in terms of chance creation, I don't think yesterday we 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 the team created sufficient chances to to be able not only to to claw back the the draw, but but to finish the game ahead. But you know they 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 wasted their chances yet again. So that's that's where I stand. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna all discuss this, and and and, and I think we all, most people who follow me on, listen to this pod and follow me on social media, know where I stand on this. Um, going into this season, the idea was, it was clear that selling Lukaku and replacing with Joaquin Correa and Edin Dzeko, the idea was Edin Dzeko would be the, you know, the the experienced striker who would help out and and drop down and build play and create chances, which he has done, and I think he's he's been an excellent signing. I don't think we can ask anything more of him than we than than, than he's given. But the idea was that Correa was gonna the, the goals that Lukaku scored were gonna be divided on Correa, 
on Jeco and but predominantly on Lautaro Martinez that he was supposed to take the, you know bear the shoulders of this ink that he was going to be the focal point. I think it's quite I I I said it at the time that I don't I don't think he can be that. I think when it comes to being the, be, the second cuz you know what he is and what he is is a second striker and he's one of the best seconda punta seconda punta or, or second strikers in the world. Um, his link-up play, his ability, his movement, he's outstanding. He's not a prima punta. He's not a natural goal scorer. He will never score more than 20 goals at most uh, per season. He's never going to be 25 to 30 per season. Never, ever. That's just not who he is. And I think maybe given the financial situation, it's it might be time. And what do I mean by that? I mean, in the summer, Inter will be forced to sell one or two big players like last summer. Uh, but they not, you know, they will be forced to do that because they need to. They still need to lower their wage bill. And as Pepe Marotta said about a week ago, in in a in a in a in an article which we reported on the site, not many others did, because it wasn't sexy. He was talking about finances and not player transfers, but they are really important. And what he said was, what matters now is no longer the most important thing is not sporting results. The most important thing is financial sustainability. That's the most important thing for them. And that means to that, in my ears, I hear long-term, homegrown, sustainable. Um, and that's that's what Marotta does when he's at his best. And I, and I fully support that. So that means when you go into the summer, you look at the ones that can raise the revenue. The choice is Lautaro Martinez or Barella, Barella and Bastoni. And that's not a choice to me. That's a no-brainer. Bye-bye, Lautaro. Thanks for the memories. Um, that's that's the financial side of it. And then I look at the replacements, and I think, well, if you can sell De Fry and him and get 100, 120 million, which is not impossible, and Marotta is, if anything, good at selling players, well, the replacements are seem to be Bremer, Raspadori, Scamacca, and even Fratesi. And to me, I say, Arrivederci, Lautaro, thank you for the memories. What about you, Jake? And then I want to go to Mo. I can't see into buying three players from Sassuolo. <clears throat> I think that that's a little bit of a, a bit of a task. Um, it, it really frustrates me. I I've made no secret about it. I think the decision to sign Joaquin Correa was a really poor one. And when you're talking about financial situation mm. and you're talking about last summer, um, I, I understand. You know. Inzaghi's come in, they've taken two of his key players away from him, it's a little bit of a gift, what have you, but in a situation where Inter have had mm. to make money to reinvest, why they signed Joaquin Correa, I have no idea. Maybe they could have signed Marcos Turam if he hadn't got injured, but we might have had a similar situation there. Um, I think it's it's really obvious at the minute, Stefan de Vrij's got to be sold in the summer. And if you swap in for Bremer, I mean, Bremer on Friday night was unbelievable. Um, I, I like him now. I'm, I very much like him. I've, I have all season, but I w- he, it was th- that moment where he completely, <clears throat> I was sold on him. So if it's up to me, I'm bringing him in in the summer. Um, I think if I could have one player from Sassuolo of the three, I'd take Skamaka, I think. If I could take any one of the three. Um, for Tessie, might be really important the central midfield options that Inter have got when Brozovic isn't playing or Borella isn't playing are vile but we know that they're going to go at least two of them are going to go anyway um, it, watching them last night for example <clears throat> when you see some of the plays that were missing bits of rotation that's what frightened me a little bit last year was solely reliant on um, defending a little bit deeper, getting Hakimi to stretch the game. Lukaku, you could, if things weren't going great, you could bump it up to him a little bit. That isn't the option now. It's more known as on creating a bit more of a team and playing through different players. Another thing that we've not mentioned as well is Chalanoglu as well. I, I don't want to be harsh, but last four or five games he's been missing a little bit. and That's not a direct brutal criticism I'm not hanging him out to dry he's, he's done better than what I thought he would since he signed in the summer and he's had some really good games this year but when you're looking at trying to create chances Inter are creating plenty of chances but it's the issue is getting Lotaro to finish them off you know like you've said he's never going to be a number nine prima punta to borrow that phrase that's never going to happen um, I, I rate him like you said I think he's one of the better players in the world in that position but he 
I'd definitely cash in on him now. I think it, I've, I've got to that point because it will be more beneficial for the team to get that money in. And Stefan de Vrij, I think his best days for Inter have gone now. Mm. So it's it's just natural evolution, isn't it? I think we're, we're at the stage with Inter where they're not going to have 300 million every summer like Manchester City to go and cherry-pick players to improve the squad. They're going to have to evolve in. I trust Pep Emeralds to do that as well because I think he's absolutely fantastic at his job. So that doesn't concern me. Mm. No, I, I agree 100%. And I think that's the thing I took away from that interview of his that he did about a week ago when he said pretty much that, you know, I took away this. The days of Romelu Lukaku for 70 million and Christian Eriksen with those high wages, those types of players, that's gone. If they bring players in that already, it's going to be Robin Gossens type, type players where, that, that, the, where the wages are low. Um, and you know and 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 to build if if there are you know if if a paulo dibala were to you know not him specifically but that level player if he were on a free transfer and he would accept six, seven million net per year, then that, then yes, Inter would end up being able to sign him. But it's quite clear they want to lower the wages, they want to rejuvenate, and they want to phase out the Vecino, Vidal, Handanovic era. And they've already done that with Onana. We're going to discuss the goalkeeping too. But yeah, no, I want to hear what you think, Mo. Where, what's your thoughts on the like Lautaro should, if Inter should sell or not? Yeah, I made a very public proclamation on uh, <laughs> on, on Twitter this week. I, I, I most certainly was against uh, the selling of Lautaro. And I might might well change my mind this season, by the end of the season if he does turn his form around and, and find his goal-scoring form properly. I mean, you know, every, every he's a young player. He's still a developing young player. And, you know, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that he is changing his game currently, learning with Inzaghi, and, and maybe we're going to see the fruits of this, this labor soon. I don't know. And if that does happen, I'm, I'm more than happy to change my mind again. But I, I think, like, you've, like you and both, both you and Jake have said, looking at the situation right now, and if it does continue the way it is, the, the way it is at the moment, there can be no doubt that, you know, regardless of how good... Lautaro is a player, and we I think we all agree that he is a great player, but his particular skill set is not of absolute value for Inter at the moment. We need somebody to convert all these amazing chances that the team creates. So, so the, priori- the priority should be in bringing in that. If Lautaro is going to become that sort of player, great. I'm, I'm more than happy to keep the guy. I think He's got bags of talent much more than any sort of uh, prima punta that we could, we could find on the market today. But unless we're able to find to, to score goals consistently and convert all these amazing chances, then you're absolutely right. Send them off as long as we replace them properly. Now, whether it's Raspadori or Skamaka, I don't know if either guy is the guy that, I mean, they both you know scored pretty decent goals yesterday. Well, I would argue that uh, that the first goal was, you know, a very savable shot. So, <laughs> no, no, I would, I would be inclined them, to agree. <laughs> yeah, ne- ne- neither of them really lit my world on fire looking at them play yesterday. Uh, I, I think maybe Raspadori in, in yesterday's game was a bit more mobile and 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 you know uh, had a bit of a. Uh, uh, go get him attitude, but and then again, that's not what we need. We need somebody who's going to convert chances in the box. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they are the answer. Maybe they're not. But um, but, but that's I think what I wanted I'll... to talk about. But that's what I wanted yeah. to talk about. Are like because I think it's quite obvious because Beppe Marotta has been tracking Skamaka for forever now, and um, and and Raspadori as well has been linked into for ages. And Fratesi seems like Marotta wants him as well. You know, the, the more reports coming out and Carnevale, the, the, the CEO at Sassuolo, keeps talking about Scamacca and Fratesi, how Inter have been interested in them for a long time and blah, blah, blah. So it's quite clear that these are players that they're going to go after. My issue is that if you don't replace, if okay, so you sell, if you bring in Scamacca, you keep Dzeko and then you keep Alexis for another year, you have to buy Raspadori as a replacement for Lautaro. You can't do another, let's have Joaquin Correa be be Lautaro because he isn't he really really isn't if that's the calculation selling Lautaro and buying those two and keeping Korea and building around him I want to go on the record and say that that's an asinine decision that is un- it's Inter will live live and regret that but if if the idea is that Korea is is going to be as he's been as a number 10 and you know next to the like would play a 3-5-1-1 at times 
and 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 be the link up player then fine great then you know to that's 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 fine but you cannot replace lautaro just with fratesi and and and, Raspa, uh, and skamaka and not replace with raspadori that would be that's insane because korea is not that player he's he can barely stay fit we know that he can't stay fit he can't score goals he he doesn't offer any assists um essentially you know he's a player who's technically brilliant and if he played futsal he'd be the best futsal player that ever existed because he's ex- excellent in tiny surfaces in, in in small spaces and he's quick with his feet but on the pitch he doesn't offer much um and he hasn't ever offered much so for me i no i i i really hope that the raspadori thing is 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 something they go after because his movement against Inter was outstanding. The goal, I mean, again, he would be the seconda punta. He would be the second striker to to link up, and they're both very young. So you have resale value. They wouldn't. They would even if they cost a lot of money. The wages would be low. For me, it's it's a no brainer. I made my decision. I want the three of them. I want the three of them, and I think it's completely doable because you're going to include, you know, players as well. We'll see. We'll see. But. Yeah, well, what, what what do you think? I mean, would you, if I were to say you Laut, say to you Lautaro out and those three in with Bremer and De Frey out, focusing on Raspadori and Skamaka, and what do you, what do you, what, do you, what do you say, Mo? Yes or no? I think uh, we will be missing a lot of fantasy, so I would uh, I would say Skamaka and Dybala rather than uh, Raspadori and Skamaka. I think Raspadori and Sakamaka, we, we've just downgraded our our attacking line from an inter-Champions League level to Sassuolo mid-table level. I'll, immediately, you know, instantaneously, in a flash, without really upgrading the engine behind them that provides chances. So what are we really expecting? Are we expecting these two young players to suddenly develop into world beaters in, in over, over the span of a summer? No, maybe, no, but no. Maybe, you know, it might be the case, but... But it's not. It's it's more of a, a bet. I think, like like you noted, uh, uh, Nima, if we replace, you know, if we sell uh, Lautaro, and we bring in Skamaka, we need somebody world class somewhere there. And it's, it's not going to be a one year older Alexis and Zeko. So I think maybe that Dybala it becomes that second punta that we need, mm. uh, brought in on a free on a on a Bosman or whatever it's called. Over the summer, uh, and then he beca- he plays he then plays in the role that he's meant to play in, which is that you know roving second striker somewhere around the box with someone like a Raspadori, so you don't lose that quality up front and you actually improve your goal scoring. This this you, would be my gut feeling. You mean Skamaka, not Raspadori, then? Yes, yes, yes sorry, yes, Skamaka. Yeah, just yeah, just making clear. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, what about you, Jake? Uh, a few weeks ago, I did say Dybala, but I've changed my mind completely on that. Um, I just think that for the outlay, I don't think you get value for money. Um, look at his injury record. We don't want to sign mm. another back in Korea. I just don't see yeah. the point. Uh, I think for the ten million a year, whatever wages that he wants, you could buy Raspadori, Skamaka, um, Fratesi. Still have change left over, probably Bremen yeah. included as well. And I think that's sensible. Um, I'd like to see him to move away from signing players like Alexis Sanchez or Turo Vidal, who are overpaid, who we are signing for the experience. I don't see the point in that anymore. I think I watched Sanchez play yesterday and I threw things at the TV watching it. He was <laughs> And he's been good this year. That's not me being, you know, probably being a bit reactionary because I was so frustrated at the performance. But Inter need to move away from that a little bit now. And I think what you said, Nima, is absolutely bang on. I think by buying Skamaka, buying Raspadori, and Fratesi, if you sign those players, you're not going to lose money on them. They're not going to be big wage players. And I'm absolutely sold on Skumaka. I, I think he's brilliant. I watched him for Genoa last year, and I thought this, he's so raw, but yeah. there's something in there that yeah. if he can catch fire, the types of goals he scored yeah. this year, and because my nerd, I was watching some of his uh, yeah. compilation videos, and the way he holds the ball up, he's got a turn of pace for a big guy. He's got things about his physical stature that a lot of players dream of having. He's only 23 as well, so uh, well, exactly. if, there's one, if there's one of the three that they sign, for me, it has to be him. But I was really impressed by Raspadori yesterday. I thought he was really good. And I have been whenever I've seen him, but... 
I mean, the goal he scored probably could have been saved, but I'm sure yeah, we'll get we're, we're, to... we'll get, we'll get <laughs> on to that. We'll get on to that. But um, well, one thing though that I want to talk about um, that you wrote in your column this week, Jake, was about the squad depth. Do Inter really have as good of a squad depth that everyone has praised Inter to have? Personally, I'm thinking I think Inter do have the best squad depth in the Serie A. But that doesn't mean that Inter have the best squad depth, actually, in terms of, I don't, I don't, you see, I I agree with, I I think D'Ambrosio, Ranocchia, Di Marco are decent in the roles they play there. I think the issue is the insecurity we're seeing in defence has got to do with Handanovic, it's got to do with De Frey's decline, and that kind of thing. You know, when when players don't trust each other, it creates or or they 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 doubt each other, not trust each other. That's too harsh. But when they doubt each other due to mistakes, whether it's the goalkeeper or their defender next to them, they don't play naturally. They don't they don't. It's not as as as, as smooth and 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 it's not smooth sailing. They they kind of overwork situations and insecurities creeps in. So I think a Bremer and a Onana would resolve that issue. So I would extend with both. D'Ambrosio and Ranocchia for another year because I think as backup players goes I think they're good enough for another year but they need to really need to address that in a year's time um, but 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 I mean if I look at the midfield Vecino and Vidal you know we had a me and me and um, Fulvio had a debate a couple of weeks ago here about some Sensi and he you know and he quite rightly said that Vesi, uh, that Sensi had no part in Inter winning the Scudetto but what exactly has Vecino had what kind of a part did he had in that Scudetto and what part has he had this season if i'm not mistaken he's missed as many matches as Sensi has due to injury but that seems to be okay for everyone and Sensi's the one who's been stamped the injury prone one whilst Vecino's gotten away with it and i don't understand that because Sensi's 10 times the player Vecino's ever been, and I like Vecino. I was one of those, who th- I liked his dynamism. I thought what he did for Spalletti's Inter was very important. But I, I, this is where we are a little bit. I think, you know, we're back to the Sensi thing to me. Um, I think that Inter don't have as good of a squad depth that everyone has made up to be. It's best. It might be the best in the Serie A, but I don't think it's necessarily good, if that makes sense. What do you think, Mo? Yeah, look, I, I, uh, I, I still stand uh, with Fulvio regarding the Sensi thing, but uh, that aside, no, I, I agree. I think, I think we're suddenly seeing, you know, look, I think the squad depth was great under Conte because Conte was great at managing an entire squad and making mm. you feel like you don't, you do, you don't have, you don't need, like you have a strong bench because he inserts the right players at the right time. What we, you know, what I'm thinking now regarding Inzaghi, one of the biggest knocks on Lazio was that Lazio had a very shallow squad because Inzaghi yeah. played the same sort of players. But really, maybe they didn't have a, a shallow squad. Maybe one of Inzaghi's faults is his inability to integrate people into the squad seamlessly and, and his ability to manage a, a, a complete squad in, you know, the most efficient, most effective sort of manner. Conte, Conte quite often relied on, you know, Vidal and, 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 and Vecino, maybe not in the Scudetto year, but in the year before. And Ranocchia even, you know, D'Ambrosio was hailed as a uh, Darmian, saved Inter. I can't remember where the game against uh, whom, when he scored it, he scored that pivotal goal. I think it was uh, against Cagliari, maybe, towards the end of the season. So, you know, again, long story short, Conte, Conte played with a full squad and he was able to integrate the, the players much more effectively and meaningfully. So, I, I think Inter's squad, you know, ostensible shortcomings from a squad depth perspective, probably says more about Inzaghi's, you know, ability to manage a large squad or uh, or a complete squad uh, rather than the players themselves. We know that, you know, we know the limitations of these guys, but it's up to you as a manager to be able to use the full squad effectively altogether. But yeah, so it, I, th- I think it's it's probably a, a, an Inzaghi thing, and he really needs to work on that. What about you, Jake? I'm going to disagree. Sorry, Mel. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that Antonio Conte didn't use the squad that often last season. I think he used the same team as much as possible. And there's one big reason for that. It's because there was no other commitments to any other competitions. There was no Champions League to focus on. I think early on in the season, at the beginning... He tried players like Kolarov in games. He started Gagliardini. I mean, he, he got a bit of time towards the end of the season, I suppose, as well. But Lukaku played nearly every minute of every game. 
Pinamonte wasn't even given a sniff when I think at times Lukaku for the last maybe 20 minutes game was already won he still kept him on Barella was literally <clears throat> running around on stubs by the end of the season he was absolutely exhausted <clears throat> excuse me I think if you look at that squad last year that start on 11 the same backfield that we see this year what's Perisic post sort of Christmas broke in and started playing more consistently Ericsson it was the same team from Christmas to the end of the season every week Granted, because into the Scudetto to aim at, I think Inzaghi's tried this year because he hasn't got the star power of Lukaku up front every game and he hasn't got Hakimi to rely on. I think <clears throat> he's tried to move things around a little bit more. I think if you look at the squad depth in this Inter team, there's, it's a, I think when you talk about squad depth, it's been able to bring players in. But the biggest thing that I learned from watching the game yesterday, and I knew this already, is without Brozovic in that midfield, that midfield is dead in the current side. Chalonoglu, you cannot rely on him to put in 8 out of 10 performances every single week. Barella cannot hold a midfield together. He's no positional discipline in that aspect. It's not his role. Brozovic mm. holds that midfield together completely. Galliardini looks like he's won a competition to play for Inter. Right? <laughs> he, was, he was that bad in that first half yesterday. <laughs> I, I partially lay some blame onto him for that first goal for a hospital pass to Chalonogli. It was just woeful. Like, it was like a three-year-old child. Vecino, I've, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying, Nemo, about him. He's, I, I quite liked him during the Spalletti year. I thought yeah. he was busy. Uh, when I went to the derby, he set up the goal for Ricardi to score. So for that reason, I've always had a bit of a, an affinity towards him. His little flick towards uh, that cross going. I, I thought he was he was good, but he, he's, he's, his usefulness has run out. Um, San Arturo Vidal looked quite a nice idea on paper, but when you consider it, possibly could have signed Tonali instead. Oh, you know, there's down, that, down, there's that down, debate, down. isn't there? Don't bring that up. It, it's my bane. It's like it's the bane of my existence, that Conte decision, and it's just I'm never going to get over it. <laughs> well, we, we know why it is, though, but if you look at that inter-squad now, you, you're looking at players who are 30, 32 and over, and there's probably six or seven of them if you really sort of label them out. And you could just chop straight away and think of the money on wages you would save by losing players like Vidal, players like Sanchez, Kolarov eventually. I'm all for keeping Ranocchia and Ambrosio because I think they're players who are just they're Trojans. They'll do anything for Inter. You know, yeah. they're, they're not players who are going to suddenly just switch off and they're cheap as well. So I'd keep them around for another year. But there's a there's an undercurrent of players in that squad that just really I'm sick of them now. I want to see the back of them, and um, it's it's a bit of a shame that it's but it, it really has come to light to me. I, I was writing my piece yesterday, and I was sat there, and I was thinking people do talk a lot about intro having depth, and they've got experience in that squad. There is, and that's what Conte wanted. But what has Arturo Vidal brought to Inter in two seasons that's really special? The Sino absolutely nothing. Injured. Especially when you talk about value for money, uh, I, I just don't see the point at all. And I'm pleased mm. that they're possibly moving towards a simpler model where you're investing money in players from clubs like Sassuolo who are growing players, younger players. If that's the model for the future, I'm absolutely all for it because financially it just makes so much more sense. You're saying Arturo Vidal at 33 is on a free transfer. You're not going to get any money out of that. So you're paying him high wages to bring you success and he's not done that enough. Whereas you sign Raspadori, 22 years old, 30 million euros, whatever, his best years of his career will be at Inter. So even if you don't yeah. make money on him, you've got the playing side out of him. And if it doesn't yeah. work, someone else will take him and you're not going to make a big loss. No, no, I agree. I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. Let, let's talk about, Mo, Mo touched on this a little bit, and I want to talk about this, about Simone Inzaghi, because I, I think, again, uh, what happened against Sassuolo is a collective thing. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the result of a lot of things going wrong. We've covered some of them already. Things that went wrong, you know, in terms of how the squad was built. I in, in the summer and the lack of a natural goal scorer. 
um, and and how Lautaro Martinez, this is who he is. I mean, his stats show that he 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 keeps his average, his goal per game average this season is pretty much on par with his entire career, and 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 the the the, the mistake was to expect him to be that number nine. We've covered that. I mean, the Handanovic thing we already know all of it. Like we're all aware of it. It's a problem, and it's it is what it is. And help is on the way. Yeah, well, that situation has already been resolved in the summer, hopefully. Anyway, I mean, someone's bring they've done something about it. Onana's coming in the summer, so. There's no not much point to really dwell on that. But one thing that I do want to talk about, and, and I want to hear what you guys think, is Simon Inzaghi, I don't necessarily think his substitutions are the issues. I think the problem is that he reads games, be they in-game or before game, sometimes really, really wrongly. And I mean, every manager can get, can get it wrong. But when and Inzaghi gets it wrong, he misses the mark. He's not by a mile. And what I mean by that is five rotation changes going into against Sassuolo is is suicide. Especially when you bring in Gagliardini, Darmian, you you bring off, you know, Barella, of course, had to be because he was suspended. So obviously you'd be playing. He's a, he's a starting player. I, I, I understand why they started with the strikers they did. But Gagliardini and Darmian, that is a mistake for me. That is That is a massive mistake. And and to expect that Barella would be able to play as a as as a as a regista in front of defense when he when he's not really ever done that or he did under Conte but not but not but that was a different system that was much more rigidly controlled and you know his vertical verticale calcio verticale etc. You had a reference point up front with with Lukaku etc. This is where I think the game was lost. As soon as I saw that lineup, I was convincing that we're going to lose. Um, and he's done this again a few times as well. I mean, we saw it in, in, in the Coppa against Empoli. We've seen it when, when he rotates. You know, it's good to rotate, but you don't. But when you rotate five, six players like that in, 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 a, in a difficult period, it's as if you're telling the squad that, you know, you're not taking this seriously. And although that's not what he's saying, but it does come across a little bit like, well, the, you know, th- that we're going to win this so we don't need to start our best players. I, I think that there there is a there is some blame to be to be shared here and taken on his back here by Simone Inzaghi. You're right. You're totally right. I think Inzaghi is a young manager. He's a growing manager. Mm. This is uh this is his first uh, posting at a top 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 tier club, and not only is it his first posting at a top tier club, it's the uh, it's the first year in 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 over a decade that this club is expected to perform at the highest level. You know, uh, we were demanding that uh, we win the second uh, Scudetto in a row, get that second star. We were demanding to get out of the group. We are demanding that we reach at least the semi-final of the Coppa Italia, which he's done. So, I mean, so not only is it a, a top club, but he's not hes not a Spalletti coming in uh, six years ago. He's, he's, he's yeah. coming in after Conte. So he, there's a lot of learning on the job that is required of him. I think he's performed fantastically well. But like you say, it's not without criticism and not without mistakes. And I think, like you've rightly pointed out, his reading of certain matches it can can go awry. So uh, yeah, I mean, as long as I'm, I'm all for making mistakes, as long as you learn from them, you know. Yeah. And and, and th- that's fine. Again, this is the wor- this is the week to screw it up. This was the week, and it's done. So if the lessons learned, great. Let's move on. You know, beat Genoa. Uh, you know, uh, throw the Liber- throw the Liverpool game. That's it. But beat Genoa and back on track to win the Scudetto. This is the most important thing for me right now. Mm, agreed. Couldn't agree more. What about you, Jake? What, what, any thoughts on, on on the Simone reading the game wrong? Because I think that's exactly. I, I agree with what, what Mo said here. Is that I, you know, he, he needs to improve and learn here because he is a young manager. And, the, you know, it's every manager gets it wrong. Every manager has gotten a game wrong, read of the game wrong. But it's how wrong you get it. I, I, that's it's, it's like the lowest level that I want Simone to, to raise in order to become that top class manager that I have, have always believed that he could have he could be. Uh, but, but, but what do you think? I think possibly the worst thing that Inzaghi could have done was start so seamlessly and produce such good football at points. Um, I think this weekend's really made me look and analyse into compared with this time last year. And people have got so excited and seen how well they have been performing at their peak this year and gone, oh, this is better than Inter last year. We've been reminded 
with what's been a horrible fixture schedule. Let's just get that correct. I even said last week on the pod, Sassuolo will not be an easy game. And mm. watching them for that first 20 minutes was peak Sassuolo. Counter-attacking football, fast-flowing football, brilliant to watch. They're dangerous. You give them a sniff, they will. They can beat anybody. They've got. They've beaten Milan at San Siro this year. They've gone and beaten Juve this year. They're a fantastic team. But I think they drew probably, Napoli. Yeah, yeah, they've they've beaten all the big yeah Juve. I've also got beat away. by Sampdoria, but you know this this is it. But I think he's been a victim of his own success a little bit, really. I think this weekend's made people take stock and think, look, Lukaku's gone. Who replaced him? Jekyll. Right. Well, Jekyll's done good, but he's also thirty-five and a bit slow. Lotaro was meant to sort of step up and take the goal burden on, like he looked, like he would early season. Then he missed a few penalties. Now he's not scoring at all. Conte and Inzaghi. Conte is a better manager than Simone Inzaghi because he's been managing for ten years longer. He he gets players bought for him more so than Inzaghi has ever had. You know, Inzaghi is younger. You take Hakimi out of the team, you place with Dumfries. Dumfries has been fantastic. I love Dumfries. He's brilliant, but he's not as good as Ashraf Hakimi. This team is weaker than it was last year. The manager is weaker than it was last year. That's just the facts. Mm. So this is a real question mark. And to expect even Pep Guardiola to have navigated this set of fixtures, I think would have been a tough test for him to come out and win a lot of them. Um, So I'm going to stick up for Inzaghi. I I agree with you both. He does really frustrate me. I I think his substitutions make me want to vomit sometimes. But... What does frustrate me a little bit, and it, I'm going to go back to the point I just made previously, he wants to use the depth of the squad. Yesterday he had to a little bit because of suspensions, okay? But he wants to use the squad a bit more. Conte did not trust some of those players mm. that he trusts, and there's a reason for that, because they're not actually that good. If you want to win a league title, and you want to compete on all fronts in your inter and you have to pick just 11 players to do that, you're not picking Galliardini, you're not picking Darmian, you're not picking Vasile, you're not picking Di Marco. You know, that's just the way it is. So he's having to use these players. He's competing on more fronts than what Conte was. You know, So it, it, it is a bit more difficult. He's still learning, and we, we've got to remember that. Whether we're going to give him enough time to learn is another question, isn't it? Whether he will learn... It also is another question. You know, we've seen it over the years at Lazio. Uh, I, I mentioned it a few weeks ago. That Milan game really sticks in my mind when he took Milinkovic Savic in Immobile off and had a one-goal lead. You know, but he is still young. But it's it's hard. I, I, I'm going to stick up from a little bit because I think he's had a really tough run of fixtures. Mm. And I think looking at the way the team played yesterday. You can see it's laying heavy on them. And you think sometimes last year when Lukaku would just bang a goal in out of nowhere. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the the efficiency in the games, the efficiency in in uh, in, 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 in early parts of games is, um, a, you know, where you win it. You know, when you score two goals within the first 15 minutes, Lukaku bangs two in and the game's over from there. You control it. That's what we miss at Inter because they have to work themselves into the game and they need three, four chances to get warm, bef- you know, before they can do anything of in terms of goal scoring, and that, that's what's missing. But we'll 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 have to wait and see. Um, let's uh, let's briefly talk about Genoa. It's it's an away game against a dreadful Genoa. Um, um, I I was talking to um to to one of our listeners on 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 DM about this. Uh, about in order to win the Scudetto, Inter, Inter, you know, Inter have. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, they've got. Um, they played 25 games. That, uh, yeah, the others have played. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, the others have played 26. Inter have played 25. That's 13 games left. And the way I look at it is, if Inter win 10 games, that's 8, 30 more points. That's 84 points. I think given how it looks this season, I think 84 points is enough to win the Serie A. Um, and so I made a little list of the games left that Inter, that, that Inter, you know, have to play, that I think Inter should win. And that is Genoa, Spezia, Empoli, Sampdoria, Salernitana, Bologna, Cagliari, Udinese and Hellas and Torino. Those 10 games and you still got Roma and Fiorentina um, and, and Juve, you know, you should ideally, I, I think that that's really doable. I, I still have full confidence in, in the Scudetto race. I think uh, I think this this tough start of the year is actually a blessing in disguise. 
like you said, right now we've only got Juve and uh, Juve and uh, Roma left, I believe, in uh, in terms of big big matches. Well, Fiorentina, uh, Fiorentina as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fiorentina, sure. Fiorentina, Fiorentina is difficult. Fiorentina is resurgent. Fiorentina has got Piatek. Uh, he's scoring goals again, so it's 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 no easy task. But really, you've you've done you've done the dirty work early, and all the rest of them are going to be uh, as he treads his throats towards the end of the season as well. So. I think 10, 10 games, 84 points looks good. I, I like I like the list that you banged off. All very winnable. Uh, let's not uh, count our chickens before they hatch. You know, we'll refine, re- rediscover that hubris after. Yeah. Inshallah, we win the the Genoa game. But once we <laughs> win that Genoa game, uh, let's 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 talk about those 10 games. You know, there'll be nine games, and yeah, no, I think mm. in my mind, you know, it, everything took. Like like Jake said, you know, every, everything this week got recalibrated a bit, you know, seen mm. in a different light and everything. You know, the rampant run towards the Scudetto is a lot more tam- tempered now. Mm. But still, I do still believe that we are the favorites and, you know, mathematically, we still control things. So, uh, yeah, should be good. For sure. So let's just talk about the Genoa game briefly. We're talking easy. We need to have to win here. I mean, I'm not even going to... You know, they, they are dreadful. Um, they've drawn their two last games that they've played were against Venezia, where they, which which were two win game, must win games for them if they wanted to stay up. They came from a goal down, 1-1 against Venezia away, and then 1-1 at home against Salernitana. I mean, these are teams that they had to beat um, in order to, to stay up. And, and it doesn't seem to me like they, you know, like, like they will. Um, so to me, I mean, they have 16 points, one win, 13 draws, 12 defeats. They, this, they're going down. Um, and it, there's no, there's nothing going to, you know, it, it's a shame because it's a team I like. I, I think I like the Genoa Derby. I think it's good for the Serie A, but I think they're going down. Um, and, and Inter have to win this game. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with a 3-0 draw, 3-0 win, win. Uh, a simple 3-0 win. I think Lautaro will score. Um, I think Chalanoglu will score. And I think Dumfries will score. What about you, Mo? I think that uh, if Inter score early, then it's going to be a high-scoring goal, a uh, high-scoring game. But I'm afraid that if Inter don't score in the first uh, half hour, 40 minutes, they might get cagey and nervous again. Uh, let me hedge your optimism with a bit of, you know, optimism as well, but a bit more tempered optimism by saying it's going to be uh, uh, an important but very difficult 1-0 win with Santo Danilo or someone of similar, you know, saintly stature in Inter coming up with the goal that, you know, we look back hopefully and say this is this is another one of those turning points in the season. If there ever was a time to play Gagliardini, it is against Genoa because he loves to score against them. Um, what about you, Jake? What, what do you think? There's never a time to play Gagliardini. He's absolutely vile. Um, <laughs> uh, this is, I, I couldn't agree more with what Bo said. I think it's its really important that Inter score in that first period. If they score in the first 15 minutes of that game, they will murder Genoa because the confidence will be lifted. Um, there'll be, it's, there's a massive contrast in quality compared to teams they've played recently. If they can score first 15, 20 minutes, I think they'll win 4-0. I think they'll batter them. Other, other, otherwise, it could be a bit of a spicy one, but um, I look at some of the teams that are down there. Venezia have tried something. They brought in a bit of experience in the window, some clever signings. They're trying to stay up. Cagliari, we've seen tonight, and they've gone and won away at Atlanta. Genoa are just terrible. They've not got another gear. Salonitano, they're trying to battle their way to survival, as we've seen over the last couple of weekends, with Genoa are just really bad. For me, they're the worst team in terms of their mentality. They need to go down to reassess completely because their transfer strategy and everything over the last four or five years has been just despicable. So, into if they can score first in that game, I think they will murder them. And I can see, I've, I'm going to mention it before, I, I can see this being the start of that run. You know, you're talking about winning 10 out of those 13 games. I mentioned right at the start of the season, Inter had a really interrupted start. You know, these staggered international breaks killed Inter's momentum. And then they had a tough run, losing against Lazio, which wasn't ideal. Um, losing against Real Madrid a little bit harshly. But then they had a really nice set of fixtures And that's when we saw the best of Inter this year. So if they can start positively against Genoa, get that early goal, win this game, it could be the start of a run. And when you compare it to Napoli and you compare it to Milan, 
Inter are not as likely to drop points in these games. It's just so important that they can arrest the decline of what's happened yesterday and really pick it up, score that early goal, and hopefully this could be a real turning point. Indeed, indeed. Right, let's move on to the part of the show where we tr- pay tribute, rip the piss out of and criticise someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the positivity. This week's Morati, which we presented by Mr. Mohamed Nasser. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent, and he surprises uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, qualities. Yeah, my Morati of the week, again, very difficult to talk about it. To talk about any sort of positivity from a footballing pers- perspective, but thankfully, Inter gave us uh, some uh, mm. proper silver linings in the renewal of the management team. And uh, today we hear that uh, Rozovic has also penned his uh, renewal, and the announcement is to be made shortly. Uh, and I think it's moves like these that really, you know, I think in 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 any other era, in the Moratti era, in the Tohir era, it's easy after a game like uh, yesterday is to get really down and uh, get really worried about the existential uh, uh, path of the team, so on and so forth. But this this current ownership, despite all of what we've said about their financial uh, difficulties, uh, they have assembled and, uh, probably the best management team in Italy and have continued to build confidence and faith in the management team and continuity. So I think uh, the renewal of uh, Marotta, Biacin and, uh, and Auxilio, along with uh, Brozovic's renewal. This, and Perisic, this, uh, and soon Perisic and Skriniar and, and, Handanovic. and yeah, Handanovic, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the whole thing, like we've, we've spoken about Marotta's actual w- w- workings many, many times. And I think he's yeah. the MVP of, uh, of the Marotti yeah. ever since joined. <laughs> but I think this week, the actual... You know, locking them in place for at least another three years is is definitely uh, the Moratti of my week. It definitely softened the blow of the the loss to Sassuolo and makes me look look ahead, you know, uh, positively and, and then with optimism to the future. For sure. Right. Let's move on to something much more comical. This week's frog, which will be presented by Mr. Jake Small. E clamoroso autogol di Ranocchia. Well, I enjoyed this one, and I've got a certain element of bias towards um, the frog for this week, which is Jose Mourinho. When I went to Manchester United as a, as a uh, match day reporter, I met Mr. Mourinho, and uh, at the time, he was getting a lot of criticism from all corners of the English media, and he was so lovely towards me, really kind, I had a good conversation with him, um, so I'll never have anybody say a bad word about Mourinho, and obviously from an Inter perspective... <coughs> He's a genius. So he's Frog of the Week this week for his rather funny gesture that made me laugh, his little telephone gesture after being sent off uh, against Verona uh, at the weekend in relation to referee's father, referee Pareto, his father being involved in the uh, Calciopoli scandal of 2006. This uh, this made me laugh. And what made me laugh even more is the fact that he's obviously clearly done his research into that and I, I just I just love Mourinho and I, I can't get enough of him and I know people have said what they've said about him being a bit past it and I don't think he's as great a manager what he was the game is moving on without him but the game be a much worse place without him mm, Agreed I I think it's 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 really really funny um, the way that I mean it's you know Pairetto is obviously the referee his father was also a referee he was implicated in Calciopoli Mor- Mor- Mourinho did that thing with a telephone and also reportedly said did Juve call you uh, or did Juve send you which is hilarious it is hilarious it's box office and vintage Mourinho right let's move on to that whole situation was a bit was a bit froggish to be honest right let's move on to something a little bit uh, much more negative this week's Modji, which I'll be presenting myself. It's already been said to death. Um, the the Handanovic situation is my Modji of the week. Not Handanovic it, itself, but the whole situation, because... It really breaks my heart because Samir Andanovic, for me, is one of the few shining lights of the darkest period in Inter's modern history, these banter era years. 
he literally saved Inter and was keeping was one of the leaders of the squad. For it to turn into what it has is not his fault. It's not his fault that he's deteriorated. What is wrong, though, is what's happened, that they have not addressed this issue for it to come to this point. That first goal against that he conceded against Liverpool, that first goal against Sassuolo, you know, yes, you can blame players not being by there and whatever, but no, no, you have to save that. It's as simple as that. Even if you're a mediocre goalkeeper, you have to save that. And he is way past his best. And he has these implosions. And he shows glimpses of what he used to be. And and I think it's sad because it's tainting his legacy at Inter, which I think would have been much better off and would have been better had he been replaced and phased out as number one keeper two, three seasons ago. And I think it's a shame because he's a fantastic goalkeeper in Inter's history, of Inter's long line of fantastic goalkeepers, which is being tainted because of these two, three seasons where he makes these insane mistakes that you expect. I mean, you Jake was talking about is somebody, you know, if, if Gagliardini won a prize to play for Inter, you know, th- that that's the level we're at with, with Handanovic. And it's heartbreaking and it's annoying. And, and it, but it's going to be addressed, so just hang in there for a few more months. Right, that's all we had time for this week. I'd like to thank you, Mo, uh, despite your little, your, your, your I hope that, or uh, this, despite the little mute issues, I hope everything, uh, I hope everything, you know, it was great to have you and, and he, to hear you spread some positivity. So, uh, as a surprise ending to the podcast, I did unmute my button on time. Uh, thank you very much for having me and suffering through my mute issues. But uh, yeah, always a pleasure, uh, Mr. Jake Smalley. I really, I, I really enjoy your um, your five things we learned, and and I and and, and that really gave me the a little bit of idea for today's show with with the with the depth thing. I thought that was a really interesting point you did. Thank you very much. I'm I'm, I'm enjoying being uh, a part of uh, doing some more podcasting, really, as well. And to be honest with you, I, I was speaking um, during the past week. Uh, I mentioned it to you. I had a little appearance on BBC World Service talking about Inter um, last week before the Liverpool game. And um, being more involved with this club is fantastic. But then you see a weekend in a week like this and it just reminds me of um, supporting Press North End who I follow around here. So, it, you know, it's it, it's just football, isn't it, I suppose. But no, I, I can see this week being a bit more of a positive one for Inter. And I hope they can sort of turn things around and maybe before the next pod we can teach Mo how to use Skype as well that'd be really handy <laughs> wouldn't it <laughs> well he, that's great right uh, until uh, that's all we have time for as I said this week um, I hope you all you're all safe take care of each other listen to your health authorities have a lovely week three points and remember sempre e solo forza 